Well, we've been going through some um, things about relationships that Jesus taught, and today uh, we come to one, uh, be great by being humble, that he taught with his words and his life. And, and there's a scene in the Bible, an exchange between Jesus and his disciples, and, and you know the scripture, um, you know the story, and you've heard it, you're familiar with it. And uh, I, I'm not going to read it like we normally do, where you read a text and then you go through it. But I, I'm going to tell it uh, with um, a little commentary in it. It's in Mark 10:32 to 45. If you want to um, look at that as as I go through it, and the story is is that there are 13 men that are walking. Um, together and of course 13 men can't really walk together and you stop and think about that uh, they can't all be talking to each other 13 men don't walk down a path together so it says that Jesus is out in front of them and the rest of them are probably in clusters of twos or threes as they walk down this road and uh, they're following behind Jesus because they're afraid this day and uh, they really don't want to be going where they're going. And what they're doing is they're headed from Galilee up north down to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the, the religious and the political uh, center of Israel. And Jesus had really upset the leaders and the power brokers with his words and his actions. And, and now they're walking right into the storm that waits for them in Jerusalem. And all 13 of them know it. And as they're walking... Jesus tells them just with kind of an economy of words, just with real bluntness about what's going to happen. And he says, the, the leaders down there, they're going to arrest me, and then they're going to turn me over to the Romans, and they're going to torture me, and they're going to kill me, and then I'm going to rise again in three days. Now, it's not good news. Uh, what would we say if we were in their shoes? If your leader told you that Jesus just tells us that he's going to die and then he's going to rise again in three days. And I think it would be natural for us to begin to ask some questions about why that has to happen, how that's going to happen. And especially, what do you mean rise again from the dead in three days? I mean, that doesn't make any sense to us. How is that possible? But that's not what the 12 did. Instead of paying attention to Jesus, they focus their attention on themselves. And it starts with brothers James and, and John. They started off and, and they approach Jesus and they ask if it might be possible that since he's going into this new kingdom, that they might have seats of honor, one on the left and one on the right. I mean, you know, we heard something about thrones and there, Jesus, and you've got throne room for us. And... The other 10, the other 10 hear what's going on and they start to get upset. And probably the reason they're upset is like, you know, it's your little brother called Shotgun. And why didn't I think of that first? Why didn't we ask him if we could get seats of honor? I mean, who do they think they are? And I, I, can, I can imagine Peter saying, well, we can, we can settle this. The only way that we, we know how to settle things like this is we'll arm wrestle, guys. Right, that's Peter. Right, he's he's got the he's got the cans here. He's just let's, let's you know, best of three, everybody, you know. Or maybe maybe Thomas Thomas goes, uh, I don't know, we we're not going to arm wrestle. That that's uh, that's weighted in Peter's favor. It's paper, scissors, rock. So let's do that, you know. But anyway, they start getting into this argument and as over who's the greatest. And one guy says, obviously I am, and no, you're not. And they remind each other of all those times and lives where they messed up and failed. And, you know, they've each got something on each other. Now, kind of a side note here. If you ever have one of those times in life where you uh, wonder, just, just a, a little bit of doubt as to whether the Bible is exactly true whether the Bible is God's inspired word or, you know, like some of the critics will say that the Bible was put together by some men who wanted to form this world religion. If you ever have a little bit of doubt, turn to a place like this 
because there's no way if you were uh, putting things together to make yourself a world religion that you would put in a bad instance like this from James and John where they say, we want to be on thrones next to you. No, you're going to edit that out, right? So I think stuff like this that shows the disciples' sin and, and their, their weaknesses really validate the word of God for us a lot. The only one who does not focus on himself this day is Jesus. He doesn't get angry for what they do. He calls them aside to minister to them. And instead of getting mad at them and saying, what's wrong with you guys? I mean, they've been together almost three years. Instead of doing that, he pulls them aside to minister to him. And what he says is this. this I, I've, I've done it from the message, which I don't use very much, but... But this just gives us, I, I think, the emotion uh, better than what some of the translations do. From Mark 10, 42 to 45, the story goes on. Jesus got them together to settle things down. You've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, he said, and when people get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Now, that's about relationships, really. So we're talking about relationships. It, all relationships depend on this. If we want great relationships, we have to get humble. We have to serve. We have to lift up the other person. And this is just one instance where Jesus says something like this. Matthew 23, 12, he says, Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. And it's a constant theme of what Jesus said and how he lives his, his life. He says the way up is down. The way to be first is to put yourself last. If you want to be great, become a servant. And over and over, he says it, he lives it. This is how he deals with people, is by putting himself second to everyone. They come first. Jesus did it. Jesus taught it. And then that critical moment when he could have scolded these, these power-hungry throne seekers, you know, he put himself under them. And he explained to them that if they wanted to be great, that they would become servants. Be humble. Years ago, Robert Fulgham uh, wrote a book um, entitled Everything That You Need to Know You Learned in Kindergarten. And if I remember correctly, it's been quoted often, but in the book, he told of some kids who formed their own backyard club. Okay, it's great to have backyard clubs where you get together a select group of friends and you covenant together, really, you know, is that Everything stays in here, and we do everything together, and we support each other, kind of like a you know a nine-year-old frat house is what it is. And he and he told this story, and they had three rules. the The rules were simple: nobody act big, nobody act small, everybody act medium. Okay, so we're not going to fake being humble, and we're not going to be arrogant. Everybody is going to be medium. Every day we face a, taste, a test of greatness. How great are you? Answer the test. Check one box. I will exalt myself or I will humble myself. That's the test. And everything that we do every day, every conversation, every relationship, will I tell them how great I am or will I exalt myself or will I humble myself? And every decision about the clothes that we buy, the money that we spend, what we do with our time, everything comes down to this little checkbox. Will I exalt myself or will I humble myself? And Jesus, in essence, turns to us and he says, I know you want to be great. And what he's saying to us, he says, the Father and I planted this, this desire for greatness in you. If, if you want to be great dads, if you want to be great brothers, great sisters, great parents, great wives, great aunts, great employers, great friends, he says, if you want to leave a mark on this world, if you want to make a difference with your life, then become a servant because that's the path to greatness. Serve. So 
Who's going to be the first one to apologize when you have the argument? How will I respond to this embarrassing problem as a parent? Can I be a real friend to someone who isn't acting like a real friend to me today? Who gets to decide how we spend our money? Who gets the TV remote? Okay, who's, who's in power here in the home? Will I exalt myself or will I humble myself? Choose one because we obviously can't choose both at the same time. It's one or the other. We can't have a good relationship and not be humble. It's impossible to win at a relationship if you're trying to be bigger and better than the other person. You can't do it. That's not the way relationships work. I say oftentimes that when I win the argument with my wife, I'm sleeping with the loser, right? So, so when you win the argument with your friend, you've got a loser for a friend, right? Every time that we exalt ourselves over the other person, we push the other person down and our relationship with them suffers because we're in unity together. Now, there's something kind of odd, I think, about this that may not make sense to us. If you really pay attention, if you want to be great, is what he asks us. Should Jesus ask us if we want to be great? Should we want to be great? I mean, he didn't say, now, don't try to be great. Try, try to be little. Uh, being great, he's, he didn't say being great is bad. Uh, you need to be a loser is what you need to be. You need to knock yourself down. You need to be a nobody in front of everybody else, and then you'll be humble. He said the opposite. He says the 12 wanted greatness, and he didn't scold them for wanting their greatness. The greatness is okay. Wanting to be great is fine. Jesus never slammed their ambition. Ambition is wanting to achieve great things in life. There's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of godly people who had great ambition. You know, think of Abraham. Sets out from his home country, and he's got great ambition. Noah, well, let's build an ark that holds the whole world. You talk about ambition. Uh, David, little David, you know, with his slingshot and the giant. Talk about ambitious. Even Jesus. Jesus sets his face, face to go to Jerusalem to save the world. Now that's ambition. It's good ambition. He didn't say, oh, I'm just a loser. I can't do anything. So let's not confuse ambition with greed and power. A ambition that's from God is not selfish. The problem isn't ambition. The problem is when we allow our need to be seen and recognized, and our name to be circulated instead of God's name. When we want to be noticed to fill some kind of emptiness that we have in us, that's where the ambition becomes a problem. But ambition to achieve great things by itself is not bad, productive. The subject of greatness is a common topic in the circle of the Twelve. Remember, Jesus was training them to be like him, so they would change the world by training others to be like Jesus. Jesus was teaching them how to bring about radical change, and they always seemed to be behind. And in that opening scene with James and John asking for these cabinet positions, these positions of honor in his kingdom, I can imagine that Jesus at that point might have had some doubts about whether these two men were ready to take the gospel to the rest of the world that he was entrusting for them to do. And he would have had that doubt because their ambition is self-serving. We're ambitious. We want something for ourselves. There's another uh, incident that's well known that shows us something about how greatness comes through humility. You know it as well, too. One day Jesus was teaching some, and some parents brought the children to be blessed. And after first being told to get back by the twelve, saying, Jesus doesn't have time for you, then Jesus says, let them come to me. And this is what he says in Matthew 18.4 in this incident with the child. He says, Who that, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus challenges us to learn about greatness from a child. Jesus says to his 12, you need to be more like these children, guys. And, you know, there's, this has been, I think, sometimes misinterpreted so much. What can we learn from children about humility? 
you know, if, if the way to be great is to be humble and Jesus uses a child as an example, then what is it about a child that teaches us about humility? I mean, at the core, all children have one thing in common, I think, and that is that they depend on someone else. They depend on parents. They depend on adults in their lives. As a matter of fact, one of the marks of becoming an adult is to say to the parent, I, I don't need you anymore. Okay, I, I can live on my own. I don't need your house. But, but kids are dependent. They can't drive. Uh, we need to make the car smaller. We need to have little bitty cars for you kids, right? Maybe, maybe like the bike lane, kids lanes, right? So they can drive their little cars around. You, you can't reach everything. We put everything way up high. You know, the counters are up this high. And most of our kids can't reach everything on the counter, so our more ingenious kids can. They know how to climb on things and how to get into cabinets and stuff. Kids can't cook. Kids don't have money to buy things, but they're just fine with asking adults, can I have some food? Can I have some stuff? Okay, would you give me some money for some stuff? They don't mind asking because they know that they have to depend. They come into this world depending on other people. Now, God created you to have a relationship with him and you have to depend on him. You don't have everything that you need. You may think that you do, but you don't have everything that you need. You're really a very dependent person. The most able of us is still very dependent. Only we believe that, that I can do it all. I can provide for myself physically and emotionally and spiritually. I can do all things through Don, who strengthens me, is what we would write as our verse. But Jesus tells us that to enter his kingdom, we have to become like a child and become dependents. You know, we have to ask, learn how to ask. Ask and it shall be given to you, right? Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. So to be humble, we know enough to depend on God. We ask God with a, a childlike faith. Now, that's not what most adults do. Our default is to demand. Have you ever uh, noticed that uh, noticed a person who just walks into some place and starts demanding stuff? So sometimes it's in a restaurant. You can hear them next next to you. And you I, I'm just not going to accept this meal. This is just this terrible. Take it back. Start over. I was like, wow, just leave. Don't don't ever send your food back, and insult the people you know, who knows what they do to it back there in the back right that's just not real smart but but people will demand all kinds of things they'll walk into a place and demand service i demand to be served here i am i'm the most important all we have to do we, we learn how to do this and it works i mean for for a lot uh, a lot of things it works really well you just have to you know look at your phone a, a lot look at your watch pretend to be rich if you're not rich be loud be demanding, be forceful. And for the most part, the world kind of goes, oh, he's somebody important. She's, she must be rich. We need to help her. They're making a scene. Get them out of here, you know. But demanding is tricky because although I can, it can get you some things, it's going to keep you away from some other things. Um, we can demand to be served on things that really don't matter much. But on important things like a relationship, you can't demand in a relationship. It just doesn't work. Well, I mean, we can act all adult and powerful and loud and wealthy and intelligent and strong, but it doesn't get anything in a relationship. I mean, it's like telling your spouse, dear, I demand that you love me more. I demand that you respect me. <laughs> doesn't get us any place, does it? You can say it louder and louder. I insist now that you love me. Doesn't work, does it, in a relationship? Son, I know that you're 21 and that you really don't want to come home for Father's Day weekend, but I demand that you come home for Father's Day weekend and show me respect and love. Won't get you anywhere in a relationship, you see. All this demanding stuff. I demand that I not get sick. I, I demand that I don't age. You see, on important things, it just doesn't work. I demand that my character flaws don't cause me problems in life. Hmm. I demand that I will be happy. See, on the important things, the things that really matter, demanding just doesn't work. 
Instead, Jesus says it's about being humble. It's about living in a way where our dependency on God becomes the source of our strength. Okay, let me say it again. Living in such a way where our dependency on God becomes our source of strength. And it's strange that in every area where demanding would not work, humility, knowing our dependency on God, works so well. So when it comes to our relationships, our, our daily humility is, is vital if we're going to live with others in a way then where we are to be at peace. And the, the issue isn't that they, that they need to change because we can't do that. We can't make other people change. But the issue is that I need to be humble, that I need to know my dependency on God. So how do I do that every day? How, you know, it's, it's a nice topic for a sermon on Sunday. But, but how do I do this every day? How do I learn this dependency? Well, Peter, uh, one of the guys that was in that group of 13 that day, that in my version of the story, wanted to arm wrestle over it. Okay, Peter, big strong Peter, in 1 Peter 5, 5 to 6, he's learned a lot since that day. Okay, He says, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Humble yourselves, he says. Isn't that strange that we humble ourselves and God exalts? I mean, did you ever think about that? We, we think that God humbles us. No, we humble ourselves. God, God waits till we humble ourselves, and then he exalts us up. The secret of humility of becoming great by being a servant is to know who we are in Christ. Now, this is where we get rather theological. You see, when we know that we have been given right standing with God, when God, through Christ, gives us righteousness, as he calls it, imputes righteousness to us, and that we are able to have relationship with him, that our sins are removed, that he no longer sees our sins, that we've been cleansed from our sins, then, you know, when we live in that, then humility starts to form. Humility doesn't form because I push myself down and I tell myself how bad of a person I am. That's one of the misunderstandings. We think, well, I need to humble myself, so I need to think of how sinful and evil and nasty that I am. But humility forms when we realize our relationship with Christ that's imputed to us, the greatness of God and his grace as it's given to us. I don't then have to win the argument to prove that because everything has been given to me. Some, sometimes um, I lose my sunglasses. Well, I lose my sunglasses a lot, and I really should learn how to buy cheap sunglasses, but I don't. I, I lose my sunglasses. Um, I found them on the workbench in the garage. I found them under the seat. I found them in the console and in the golf bag and the trunk, just various kinds of places. I'm always losing my sunglasses this time to time of year. And they're supposed to be in that little 24-inch cabinet uh, beside the refrigerator where it's all the Don junk that goes there and some of the Nina junk too, but mostly Don junk that goes in. The glasses are supposed to be right there, so when the glasses aren't there, I get a little suspicious that somebody perhaps has moved my glasses, you know, right? I mean, obviously, I, I wouldn't lose my own glasses. So, you know, have you seen my glasses? That's what I ask. This is embarrassing, but since it is, you know it's true. On more than one occasion, when I asked that question, my glasses were on the top of my head over my hat. Right? I'd looked in the basement, in the cars, in the garage, and every logical place, and I was wearing my sunglasses the entire time and didn't know that I had my sunglasses all that time. And I was ready to blame someone else for losing my sunglasses or, you know, putting them someplace where they needed to go. And it's, it's like who we are in Christ is at times that, that this battle to be great, to be somebody, that we've misplaced our righteousness. We've misplaced our identity in Christ. 
We forget daily who we are. You know what I mean? And we begin to believe what the world says about us, that I have to struggle to be great, that I have to do more than other people to be great, that, that to be somebody I have to be smarter and richer and better looking and more talented and cool, right? When all along, God has imputed our identity to us. And he has said, you are mine because of Jesus Christ. And we wear that around every day. And some days it's on our hat. We don't even know it. And we struggle with humility. And I walk around every day looking for my greatness. And it's been given to me at that moment that I first believed. And I can't make my greatness anymore. I can't make it any less. It's been given to me by God. And the way that I become great with other people is by putting myself least, Jesus says. Be like Jesus. Put yourself least. No other person can lift you up. So I'm back to my daily checklist. Check one box. I will exalt myself or I will humble myself. Well, let's sit with a few minutes with that in prayer.